I thought long and hard about focusing on the fatted calf part of the lesson by uttering puns that steer us toward having a stake in the meaty vein of humor. But I decided I didn't have friends enough to spare rib meat, if you will, but to keep friends, I decided to beef the sermon up with Jesus theological. And my hope at this point is that I haven't butchered the start of the sermon with too many puns. Forgive me, I wrote it while heavily calf finagling. <laughs> All right, enough puns. I did check to make sure there wasn't any rotten fruit before I did that. <laughs> but let's get to Jesus' theology, which relates in a way to the fatted calf because his story of the prodigal son has many meal references, a meal for swine, a drink of meal with swine, a drink of meal with family, a meal with the entire family, with the prized food of first century Palestine, a fatted calf being served. And it shouldn't surprise us too much that Jesus has meals in this story. Earlier this month I preached about his meal ministry. Rome had these elite meals that the poor could only dream of being invited to. And Jesus had the very opposite sort of meals, open to all, where Jesus offered food and community, and most of all, love to absolutely everyone who wanted to come. Jesus were the dreamed of meal for the entire family of God that we discussed last in Isaiah 55. The story of the prodigal son is a metaphor for God's dream meals for everyone and the radical love that they require and provide and symbolize. Now most of us probably gathered the lesson today is about love, but modern Americans tend not to fully appreciate that the love at the center of the story is unconventional, topsy-turvy, wild, unchecked, and outrageous love in Jesus' original telling. Jesus, as we heard, told the prodigal son in response to complaints by religious folks that Jesus is hanging out with tax collectors and sinners, the culturally dishonorable and shameful. In Jesus' name, you'd be a fool and a sinner yourself to hang out with him. It'd be shameful to do so. And Jesus' opponents are refusing to validate his efforts at stretching God's commandment to love your neighbor as far as it can go. He pushed it to the maximum point of loving the entire spectrum of humankind. That sort of all-encompassing love has long been opposed by many in religions, including Christianity. But nonetheless, Jesus' way was and still is very much about everyone who wants in getting in. And what's more, they sit at the table as equals and are loved with no strings attached. That's radical. Even today, Jesus' table ministry and the rest of his way are doing justice and loving kindness and walking humbly with God. It's where they get played out. It's where the rubber meets the road. And it's not just at the table. We, we don't just eat the fat and calf and play nice and then go home and be mean or do nothing or just love a select few until we return to the table it's supposed to be loving everyone as best we can all the time. It's supposed to be doing justice for everyone as best we can all the time. It's supposed to be loving kindness for everyone as best we can all the time. It's supposed to be walking humbly with God as best we can all the time. You see, Jesus took very seriously the command to love God and neighbor and his followers call to take them very, very seriously, too. Jesus' story of the prodigal son shows what that means. It is layered so thick with the meaning of radical, unconditional love, it's absolutely brilliant. The result is unlike anything that fundamentalists and other religious leaders like to hear back then, or for that matter, now. It's 
a story where shameful, sinful acts of the worst kind keep no one from the Father's table or from the Father's love. Indeed, God as Father runs to greet the sin and lovingly welcomes you to the table with open arms. Everyone can come to that table. Everyone. The only ones who don't come are those who choose not to. When Jesus told this story, land in Israel was considered a gift from God that fathers passed on to their sons. And those sons had an obligation to honor their fathers, family, and the land. And a part of that was staying with the father to work the family property and take care of the parents in their old age. For a son to ask for his inheritance from a still living parent was shameful. For a son to sell inherited family property was shameful. For a son to abandon the father and the family was shameful. For a son to travel to another place and squander the property to Gentiles in scandalous living was shameful. And the prodigal son does all those shameful acts in the first two sentences of the story. Demanding, Father, give me the share of the property that belonged to me. And then the son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And he squandered the property and distant living. To do those things in first century Palestine was terrible. It was shameful and dishonoring to the son, but also to the father and to the family. Father's culturally ashamed by the son's lack of honoring him, but also by the father's own reckless handing over of land to an irresponsible grass. But it gets worse. The son piles on more and more dishonor and shame. He works with unclean pigs, strive, striving to be a swine herder in the Gentile world. Perhaps the worst possible thing for a son to do. Well, there's something worse. The son actually wanting to eat big food. It's a sign of his willingness to be even swine-like. And that's as low as you can get, unless you're a, a dying pig. We're told in the story of the son is starving. He is dying. This was a very, very shameful man to Jesus' audience. You could do nothing worse or become anything worse than that son. Tax collectors and the sinners, the, the religiously objected to, had nothing on this guy. Jesus intentionally made him a bottom of the barrel scoundrel. And there, at the bottom of life, Jesus has the son repent. And repent, a word we hear a lot, especially at length. It means to turn around, to get back on the track toward God. Jesus tells us the son bottomed out and then. He came to himself, he said, How many of my father's higher hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your higher hands. This son knows he's no longer an elite. His shameful acts made him a nobody to the culture. His hope is to return. Treated like a peasant, hired to work for the family. Ironically, the elite landowner's son will be happy to move from dying swine to a living nobody in the culture. And that may not seem like much of a step up, but it's a dream that would allow the son to live because as it is, he is just a dying pig of a man. And so Jesus tells us the son set up went to the father, but while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion, and he ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The father said to his son, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Bring him a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fat and calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. The father didn't even wait for the culturally shameful son to come to him, but rushed to him, enveloping him with an extravagant, extraordinary love. 
to the culture that father's conduct would have been shameful and selfish. He might even speak to the son who has shamed himself on the father and the family. But this father does not care about cultural shame, shunning, or mores that would keep love from anyone. This father's love is unconventional, it's unconditional, it's topsy-turvy, it's wild, it's unfair, it's outrageous, it knows no shame. The father has shameless love. The father's a shameless fool for love. And we love this story exactly for that reason. We all want love like that, don't we? We want God to love us, regardless of whether the culture or anyone else including us, thinks we are shameful, unfit, unworthy, nobody. And God does indeed love us just like that. And this is a story about that love. Love for someone as unfit as possible, a shameful, unworthy, nobody, so worthless is he. The story's original audience would not have guessed the prodigal son could ever be loved or in a place of honor again. Yet, before the son even apologized, the father ran to the son and hugged him and kissed him and made him the guest of honor at a great feast. Jesus' theological point in the story is that wayward people only have to turn to repent and toward love, and there is love meaning unconditional. It's a love that has always been there. The father never stopped loving the prodigal son. Unlike Rome, where the elite get to a feast at Jesus' table, at God's table, the most wayward are also at the feast, extravagantly loved and celebrated and brought to the table by the Father just as the elite are. Jesus' new ministry was about providing love so wide and so expansive that he refused to recognize shame. Tax collectors and sinners were as welcome as the religious elite. Jesus' theology is that real and perceived shame never, ever keeps us from God's love. Never. Good news doesn't get any better than that. Today's lectionary reading is a, a parable that was told in response to Jesus' opponents grumbling that he welcomes the sinners and eats with them. Jesus takes their criticism and he makes a hero out of a father who loves and lets in even the worst of the worst sinner, a parent dishonoring, land losing, swine herding, pig wannabe. Jesus' lesson is God's love stretches as far as it can go. God loves the enemies and the cultural the worthless and the shameful. All are welcome as guests of honor alongside of everyone else. Jesus' primary point is that anyone, anyone, taking steps toward God's feast of love will find themselves enveloped by love, that love that was and always is there. We can hear that in Jesus' teaching today, but also in other acts and teachings of Jesus. Jesus sides with the outcasts, the rejected, and the narrative tax collectors, adulteresses, lepers, poor. And yes, he loves the rich and elite and religious and Romans and Gentiles too, even those who come at him with swords and those who crucify him, even the criminal on the cross who mocks him before he dies. Nothing, nothing can keep us, you and me, and anyone else who turns toward love from Jesus' table or God's love. Absolutely nothing. Not shame, not shamelessness, not beliefs or non-beliefs, not biblical or cultural mores. For Jesus' love washes away whatever it is the world thinks or we ourselves think is unlovable filth. No dirt keeps us from the table for Christ's community, from God's love. And that's just what we need to hear. What everyone needs to hear. We don't have to do anything to get love. It's there always. But to participate in it, we need to turn toward it. What great news. All can come to the table and be loved and celebrated and treated as equals. The only one who don't come are those who choose not to. And at the end of the story, the elder son stands in a field wanting 
lesser feast, the goat meat for himself, and a fatted calf awaits him, feasting at a dream meal the entire family. The elder son, like the prodigal son, has a choice to make. He needs to repent and turn and get on the path of love to be a part of it. He needs to choose to come to the shameless feast of the Lord his father, and so do the religious leaders. It's the same choice we all have to make. God loves us just as we are, whether we like it or not, and that sounds great. But God loves everyone else too, just as they are, whether we like it or not. That's the radical part. And we can choose to reject that and stand in the field lamenting that we didn't get a goat feast with just our friends. Or we can choose to celebrate that God, the Father, loves everyone and join in the feast with a primo, fatted calf and be a part of that. Jesus way.